Hi, it's Dr. Ken here with you again. We're on Lesson 7, Part 2, and we're now going to be looking at power factor correction. So industry and electrical energy distributors try to maintain a high power factor. And I think I mentioned this before. They like a power factor between 0.9 and 0.95. Anything less than that, um, they end up charging you a lot of money. Uh, most loads are inductive, that is, they are coils of copper wire around steel, which means motors, transformers, those kinds of things. So most loads are inductive. So capacitive reactance is often added to the load to improve its power factor. So if most of the load is inductors of some kind, we often add capacitors to the load to offset that reactance. If you remember, Inductive reactance is 90 degrees the opposite direction to capacitive reactance, so the two can directly um, cancel each other out. An example is a capacitor in a typical fluorescent lamp fitting, which counters the inductance of the ballast, and we'll explain that a little bit more in detail in a moment. So here's a fluorescent lamp circuit, and probably most of you at this point haven't done lighting, so you may not understand how a fluorescent tube works. So I'm going to explain it to you. A fluorescent tube here, and you can see where my, my cursor is at the moment, is what we call a low pressure mercury element. So this low pressure mercury gas, in other words, the gas that's inside the tube it's mercury gas, and it's at a lower pressure than atmospheric pressure. Now, I don't know if you've ever um, broken a fluorescent tube. I've probably broken a couple of hundred over my time. But you'll notice that the glass doesn't spread out. It kind of implodes on itself. That's because the, the gas inside the tube is at a lower pressure than the air outside. So if you break it, it tends to implode. So this mercury gas, we need to get it an electrical current flowing through it and it puts off ultraviolet light. The fluorescent tube on the inside of the tube is actually lined with phosphor. Um, that's that white coating you can see and as the ultraviolet light produced by the conduction of electricity through the tube, through the gas, the UV light is converted to white light. The difficulty is that once the uh, tube has arced across and these little things you can see on the end called filaments are actually heater elements so we have an active coming here if you watch my cursor we have an active coming through here it goes through a heater element back out through a glow type starter it's called then back through another heater and through a ballast that's our inductor and back to neutral so when you first turn on the light, these little elements glow red hot, heating up the gas and encouraging electrons to be released, allowing the igniting of the gas. So once the gas ignites, electricity starts to flow through the gas. It gives off UV light, as I said, and white light is seen as it comes through the phosphor. Now, the difficulty is with a fluorescent tube, once the gas has actually ignited and it's conducting electricity, it goes from being highly insulative to being highly conductive. In other words, the resistance of the gas drops dramatically. So we have to put something in the circuit which is going to restrict the current. And along comes our friend, the ballast, that does that. So the ballast restricts the current and allows the right amount of current to flow through the gas in the tube to give us the light. The difficulty, of course, that this is a inductor. It's just a coil of wire wrapped around a steel core, and it's highly inductive. So when you're buying a high power factor corrected fitting, it has a capacitor fitted in parallel across, and the inductance of the ballast is being offset by the reactance of the capacitor. So the two reactors here, one at plus 90 degrees, the other one at minus 90 degrees, they're 180 degrees apart. So from the outside, from the supply side, it looks like 
the lamp has a power factor of 1 or very, very close to 1, normally about 0.95. So, here's a little description of what I've just been through. The lamp is made of low pressure mercury. It has a phosphorus coating so our light turns to white. We have heaters and a starter to get the gas tube up and running. Gas before conduction has what we call high impedance. But once the gas is conducting, it has very low impedance. So we need the inductor to restrict the current after the gas starts to conduct and now the power factor is low because of the inductor and the ballast. So finally we add a capacitor bringing the power factor back to about 0.9 or 0.95. So there you have it. That's why we have to add a capacitor into our fluorescent light fittings but it only applies to fluorescent tubes and as the technology of LED lighting starts to uh, displace fluorescent tubes there'll be less and less of these ballasts being used therefore there won't be any need for the capacitor to be added in those kinds of fittings other places you can see capacitors is in high voltage substations so the supply authority themselves you'll often see these in the high voltage switch yards this first uh, drawing here you can see that's a 36 kV so 36,000 volts and it has 18 MVAR you'll notice that's 13 megavar capacitor bank so they actually switch the bank in in a couple of stages just depending on what's needed on the right hand side similar thing again but this is 132 kV so very very high voltage capacitor bank at 96 MVAR so very, very high amounts of capacitors being used to bring the power factor back on the system. So capacitor banks are used at various points in the electrical power distribution system to help control power factor, mostly lightly loaded transformers. So the transformers tend to get uh, lightly loaded at night or on cooler days when no one's running their air conditioning systems. So when the load goes light, supply authorities will often switch in these capacitor banks. So let's look at power factor correction and what we can do and how we can determine it and what we can do to correct power factor. So on this little exercise we're determining how much capacitance to add to improve the power factor from 0.5 to 0.9. I'll just get my cursor pen up and running. So at the moment we've got 0.5 and that's what 60 degrees gives us. You can see up here 60 degrees. So we've got a 0.5 at 5 amps and we want to bring it back to 0.9 so we want to add a capacitor and if you haven't already um, noticed we're dealing with parallel circuits so if we're dealing with parallel circuits you've got to remember the voltage is the reference and we're thinking about the currents and their relationship to each other and the supply so this is parallel single phase AC and we're thinking about current rather than voltage. So this diagram on our right hand side helps us understand what we can do to represent the current. So we're going to see that here's our 5 amps at 60 degrees. So our 60 degrees is up here, that's the angle from the horizontal and the length of the line is represented by our 5 amps and you can see one major division from here to here is 5 amps sorry it's 1 amp so the length of this line is 5 major divisions that's the first piece of information we can put on our phase diagram 
the next piece we can put on our phase diagram is we know we want to get to a power factor of 0.9. So we put in cos to the minus 1.9, and guess what? It's going to tell us 26 degrees. Now we don't know how big the current is yet. Right? We don't know what that current is yet, but we can put in our line. So I'll just draw it dotted on top of the green one for now. So you have to draw in a line at 26 degrees. And you've got to draw it in all the way out here because we don't know where it's going to interact. Now what we do know, if you remember, is that current through a capacitor is at 90 degrees up here. So we've got 90 degrees for our IC, our current. So what we do is we simply take that phaser and we transpose it down here at 90 degrees. We project from this point up. And again, I'll just dot it in. We just dot it in. And where the two lines intersect, is where the orange phaser represents the current for the capacitor and the green phaser where it intersects now represents the current total. So we've reduced the current total to the green line by introducing the orange amount of current. So the next thing we need to do is we know that each of these divisions, if you remember, each of these divisions here equals one amp. So we can now scale off our diagram how much current we would have to add in for the capacitor and what our I total would be. So that's a very important process. I'll just go through it again. We put in the red phaser. We know its length and we know its angle, minus 60. So we can put in the length and we can put in the angle. We know the angle of where we'd like to get to, so we can put a phaser in, but we don't know its length. So we have to project it all the way through. Then we know that the current through a capacitor is always at 90 degrees and all I'm doing is tip to tailing down here and I'm going from tip to tail and I'm projecting up for the capacitance at 90 degrees and where the two lines intersect back in this direction is the IC and between that point projecting back to the origin is our I total here. So here's our phaser diagram solution. Our motor was connected to a 230 volt, 50 hertz supply, took five amps. Power factor was at 0.5. We wanted to improve it to 0.9. So how, we must, how much VAR rating would we need to add in? So we know this information. Phase angle of 0.5, phase angle of 0.9 is where we'd like to get to. So we know we're moving from 60 degrees to 26 degrees. And of course, we know the length of the phaser. So we can draw the phaser diagram that we did just previously at 9.11. And again, here are the step steps. I'll just go over them again. Draw the reference phaser for voltage. Draw the scale phaser of one amp at 60 degrees lagging the reference draw a vertical line at a right angle to the reference tip to tail and then draw a phaser that re represents the current i2 this line is drawn from the origin and where it intersects the vertical line at 26 degrees so measure the distance between the tips of the two phases that will give you the current 
and if you scaled it off, you would have got 3.1 amps. So our IC scale, just scaled off the drawing. And the best way to do it is with a scaled drawing of a phasor diagram. We know we've got to add an IC, a current capacitor, of 3.1 amps. So this is our same drawing again. And you can see IC now equals 3.1 amps. And I'll just add that to the uh, add that to the drawing. So our IC now equals 3.1 amps. Simply scaled off the drawing because we set our scale here was 1 amp. So continuing the calculations now, we, we have the current. And again, let's get my pen out for you. Here's our current that we scaled off our drawing. We now want to know what XC is. And if you remember the formula for XC, if you know the applied voltage, which we do, and we know the current, so we can go 230 volts divided by 3.1, it's going to give us a capacitive reactance of 74.2 ohms. Then step two is take the equation XC equals 1 on 2 pi FC. Remember, there's two ways to find XC. So this was the Ohm's law. This is the other way of doing it if we know the frequency. XC equals 1 on 2 pi FC. So simply we can transpose our equation and say that C is equal to 1 on 2 pi FXC. So we've simply transposed and made C the subject of our formula. So 1 divided by 6.28 multiplied by 50 multiplied by 74.2 means I would have to add a capacitor into my circuit of 42.9 microfarads, we may as well call that 43. And then step 3, how many VAR is being added? And we know that volts amp reactive is simply the voltage across the capacitor multiplied by the current through the capacitor. So 230 multiplied by our 3.1 and we get 713 volts amps reactive. And they have forgotten to put the R on here there, haven't they? So volts amps reactive. So we did a scale drawing. We found out what our current would be required for our capacitor and then we use some Ohm's law to work out the capacitive reactance. Then we used our reactive formula to then work out the size of the capacitor we would need and then simply to work out what the VAR is. It's the voltage multiplied by the current through the capacitor tells us the volts amps reactive. For those who are bits of brainiacs, you can actually do all of this using trigonometry and Pythagoras' theorem. So um, this part of the lesson is not something you have to be able to do, but if your brain works that way, it, it may be helpful. So really what we've just done is a whole heap of tr couple of triangles inside triangles. So if you look at this here, and again, I'll just turn on my pointer pen. So complete phasor diagram is A. But if you notice, we have a triangle formed out here. And that's this triangle. I've just drawn around that triangle. And
we have another triangle that's bordered this way. I'm using a slightly different colored pen. Hopefully you can see it. And we've got another triangle. I'm kind of using a cyan color for that triangle. And that's that one over here. So by understanding that we've got two triangles within each other, and understanding that this is the resistive component, and this is the current through the motor, then we can work out what the total reactive current is for the whole for the whole picture, for the whole diagram. And once we have that, we can also then work out what Ix2 is because we have this and we have this angle. Right? If we have this and we have an angle, then we can use trigonometry to work this out. So again, coming back to this phase of diagram, the big triangle, we have an angle. We have the resistive component. We have the inductive component. And again, we can use trigonometry to work this part out. So that's all we're really doing. We're playing with two triangles to work out what IC is. We're effectively going to work out this side of the triangle and then this side of the big triangle. We're going to subtract the two triangle on this two triangles on the, this face and end up with this value in here. So that's the bit we want to get to. So if we can work out what the side of the big triangle is, we can work out what the side of the little triangle is, we can subtract them and get back to this value here mathematically rather than doing it using a phase of diagram. But as I said, for, you, for most students, we prefer you to use the phaser diagram done to scale and just scale it off is much easier. But for those who'd like to do it uh, mathematically, let's have a uh, quick look at how we can do that. We know we had 0.5 power factor to start with and we know that came in at an angle of 60 degrees and we know we had it had a 5 amp length. So we can actually calculate the current resistive. So I resistive is simply the current multiplied by the power factor. So in this case, 5 multiplied by 0.5 is going to give us that side of the triangle. So we're just simply getting, and um, give me a tick here, and I shall go to the pen so if you remember our triangles looked like this and we're just getting I on this side and that side is just a power factor multiplied by 0.5 will give us this side of the triangle. Once we have our 2.5 of course we can then work out this side of the triangle which is the x the current sorry the current x1 so the long side of the triangle and if we do that using a bit of Pythagoras which is simply I squared so that one squared plus that one squared equals this one squared and if we want to make IX the subject of the formula 
we know it's going to be I2 minus IR2 and we have both of these values we knew this one was 5 amps and we knew this one was 2.5 amps therefore we can calculate this side at 4.33 amps so simply transposing our Pythagorean formula to get where we needed to get to and we now know that the total current on the big side of the triangle is 4.33 so here we have it pre-drawn for us we know that the IR side was 2.5 we knew this side was 5 amps and all we've done is calculate IXL at 4.33 amps so we have the big side of the triangle we've now got to get inside here and do the small triangle so this time we know we're trying to come down to 0 0.9 instead of 0.5 we know that 0.9 gives us a angle of about uh, 26 degrees we still know that our IR hasn't changed at 2.5 amps so we can now calculate IX2 again it's just we're using tan in this particular case so we're working using tan and if we go tan of 25.84 degrees multiplied by 2.5 that means our small triangle now on the x2 side is 1.2 amps so if you subtract x1 from x2 that's the big triangle subtract the little triangles faces we end up with 3.12 amps remember that's what we scaled off our drawing so you can do it mathematically and get through it that way so effectively now we've worked out what the small side of our triangle here is at 1.2 amps and we've got there mathematically simply by using some trigonometry so we knew what the IR was and we've calculated using trig in actual fact tan to get the, uh, the value so simply what we've done now is taken the 1.21 amps here and the so here's our so I'll just draw it in for you that's our 1.21 on that side our overall was 4.33 which we used a bit of trigonometry and Pythagoras to get there and of course that means all we had to do is subtract 4.33 and 1.21 meaning this is 3.12 amps for IC which is where we needed to get to and then we can continue on calculating how much capacitance we needed to create that current and then how many VAR that would represent so another place um, that you can find power factor correction that uh, I should also mention as part of this lesson is uh, synchronous motors so one of the places um, in New South Wales where synchronous motors are used to do power factor correction is at Tumut 3 power station and you can see here the transformer floor at Tumut 3 power station and these three machines down here are not only generators they're also motors with what they call underslung pumps so the, those three machines at the far end of the hall can be generators and they can be pumps and because they can be pumps it means that we can actually spin them round not actually make them do any pumping but actually if we over excite their magnetic fields we can cause the power factor to lead or lag because they're synchronous machines 
and if I can create a lagging power factor or a leading power factor in case in particular we want a leading power factor then that can be added into the New South Wales grid and do power factor and voltage correction using what's called a synchronous condenser or a synchronous capacitor. So the big generators at Tumut 3 power station, you can see our ex-prime minister here walking past the power station itself. It's at Taubingo's Tumut 3 and uh, those three generators there can operate as synchronous motors. We can over excite them and cause them to create VARs and those VARs can then be added to the New South Wales electrical network to do power factor and voltage control. So not only can we add just straight capacitors, we can also add these synchronous machines as rotating capacitors to do a similar thing. Um, low voltage power factor correction, here you can see a picture of a standard switchboard where my cursor is and there's a power factor correction unit and you can see a power factor meter. Basically this is a power factor meter over here blown up. They, it simply measures the three voltages and the current on one of the phases. Um, we assume that the, the loads are reasonably well balanced so we only measure the current on one phase and it switches in and out blocks of capacitors and you can see here the capacitors these are three phase capacitors in this tin can arrangement there's some fuses and or circuit breaker protection and there's also a small amount of inductance added not to offset the capacitors themselves but just to stop inrush current so that when you turn the things on you don't suddenly pop the protection fuses because when a capacitor is first turned on it looks like a short circuit and can have a relatively high amount of inrush current so they add a little bit of inductance in the front end just to slow the inrush current so don't be tricked if you see a power factor correction unit the power factor or the bars created by the capacitors far outweigh the inductor that's there to slow up the inrush current and Here's one of our uh, little analogs that we use to represent what's happening with power factor. Remember, power factor is the real power. So here we've got a coffee with a throth on the top. The coffee in the mug is the real power. The reactive power is the throth on top of the coffee. And the apparent power is the overall cappuccino. So remember, the power factor is the real power. And... On the bottom, if you took the square root of the apparent power plus the bar, it would give you the apparent power, remembering our little power triangle. So the ratio between real power and apparent power gives you the power factor. So when we're adding capacitances into a industrial installation, we're trying to reduce the reactive component by adding capacitors which are at 90, sorry, at 180 degrees from the inductors in the circuit therefore cancelling out or making the throth on the top very much smaller so you end up with more real power and less reactive power. Now the supply authorities um, as I mentioned like you to keep your power factor at about 0.9 or 0.95 and if you don't they have two charges that they use they have the kilowatt charge which is the real power and they have a KVA char KVAR charge. So the more KVAR you have, they charge you a lot of money. You, I've been in factories where the bill for the month might have been about $25,000 for real power, but the KVR charge was another 15 odd thousand dollars on top of that for the KVAR charge because they hadn't done anything to correct their power factor. So supply authorities have two parts to their bill. They have the kilowatt hour charge and they have the KVAR demand charge, which can be very, very substantial. So let's summarize what we've done with uh, power factor. True power is P, does the work, and is the power dissipated by the resistance in a circuit 
and power is the volt amps multiplied by the cos of the angle and it's measured in watts. Reactive power is Q, does no work. The units are volt amps reactive and to work it out Q is equal to volts amp sine of theta. The apparent power is the total power that appears to be consumed by the circuit. It used the symbol S and its units are VA or volts and amps. So S equals VI or volts times the current, hence the VA. And of course, we want to keep our apparent power as low as we possibly can, so we avoid that KVAR charge. Power factor for any AC circuit is the ratio of the power to the apparent power. So if you've got the power and you have the apparent power, you can work out the power factor. It's also the cosine of the phase angle between line, current and supply voltage. A low power factor means that the load is taking a high reactive power. This requires additional current from the supply which can cause losses in the power lines and requires higher rated switch gear and protection equipment. So you get heat losses, IR squared R losses and your transformers and your generators have to be big enough to carry the apparent power. Summary three, true power can be measured with a watt meter. Apparent power can be simply measured with an ammeter and a voltmeter. So as long as you can measure the current and the volts, you can measure the VA, where apparent power is simply the product or multiplying the ammeter by the voltmeter reading. Most electrical installation and distribution systems are inductive, therefore have a lagging power factor. So we have to add in some capacitors to bring it back. Electricity distributors use controlled capacitor banks and they like to keep their power factor around 0.95. A lot of people say to me, why don't they make it just a power factor of one? Well, it's the law of diminishing returns. You can add, you've got to add an awful lot more capacitors in to eventually get to a power factor of one and it's just not economically viable. So a power factor of about 0.9 is economical or 0.95. And finally for this lesson, industrial and commercial and residential installations above a certain size. So if you've got residentials above 10 units it is, then you have to maintain a power factor of 0.9 or higher. If you fail to do so, then the supply authorities are going to charge you a lot of money for that KVA demand charge. Other methods used include capacitor bank, Synchronous running motors, they're the ones at the Tumut uh, 3 power station that I was talking about. So you can use synchronous running motors at a leading power factor. And it's called static VAR. I don't know why they call it static VAR. But it is the machines rotate with a leading power factor and create static VAR. So I hope you've enjoyed your lesson on what we can do to create power factor correction.